Success is often described as a journey, a humble beginning with an improbable ending. On November 12, 1990, the Washington Redskins began their journey. But their start was not humble. It was horrifying. A coach always has a dreaded fear. And the dreaded fear for me was that game. Boy, what an unfortunate night for the Redskins, who have been battered tonight. They're helpless. The Redskins are helpless. Joe Gibbs watched in disbelief as nine of his players went down with injury. Five of the wounded were either carried or carted off the field. They beat our eyes out that year. I mean, literally, that's the nightmare for me in coaching. As the casualties mounted, Eagles players taunted the Redskins. Their words became this game's enduring identity. The body bag game. Why we were sustained all those in one game, I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. Because I thought played. It was Washington's most disheartening defeat in a decade under Joe Gibbs. The Redskins' reign of the 80s appeared to be over. But Washington's players would not let the body bag game become their burial. Instead, they made it their revival as the Redskins pushed aside their pain and focused on regaining their pride. It was, it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing as a player to, to hear, uh, you know, this body bag game. You know, the Redskins were the doormats and we got handled that day. So we just filed it away and said, hey, we'll get another shot at these guys. They've never beaten us for anything significant. And uh, if anybody comes out of the NFC East, it's not going to be those doggone Eagles. Two months later, Charles Mann and the Redskins got what they wanted. Our guys had tremendous pride. We went back up there, and I think it's one of the best efforts I've ever had out of a football team. We're playing the Philadelphia Eagles. They handled us in the game prior, and now we get a shot back at them. Play action fake again by Rippon. Good protection. Lots it in the end zone for Mark. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. I think every one of us kind of felt that it was something more than just a playoff game. You know, we responded very well and very professionally and, and went out there and did our job. Hey, let's win. Hey, let's win with, hey, win with style, man. Win with style. Great job. Hey, proud of all of you. Proud of all of you, man. Great job. The Redskins earned their revenge against the Eagles and with it, a trip to San Francisco. But amid the celebration, Washington's players knew that the Eagles were not the 49ers. And Mark Rippon was no Joe Montana. A sixth round pick in 1986, Rippon's first five years in Washington were marred by injury, inaccuracy, and erratic play. His mistakes were a constant source of scrutiny in a town accustomed to winning. Let's face it, he's going to be judged here with the Redskins if he can win a Super Bowl because that's what other quarterbacks here have done. And so he's going to be judged on that. But by the time the Redskins arrived in San Francisco, Rippon's teammates had already reached their decision. We knew we weren't going to win it. We knew we weren't good enough. And uh, the number one guy is Mark Rippon. The Redskins were not alone in their assessment of Rippon. Even their opponents could sense a quarterback in doubt. His eyes weren't telling me that he was believing in himself. He came up to the line of scrimmage, and in the middle of the first quarter, I came to the sideline and said, this game, this game is going to be won. This guy doesn't believe he can do it. 
Back is Ripper to pass. Got time. Throws it up. Picks off in the end zone. I Intercepted. Can't it. I don't know what Mark was looking at. They had two opportunities down there, and Mark throws two interceptions. You knew it's going to take a great quarterback with great leadership skills that is super confident to help you win. And he didn't have it. As a quarterback in Washington, D.C., nothing less than winning the Super Bowl is acceptable. And if you didn't lead them there, then uh, your days are going to be numbered. Washington Redskins owner Jack Kent Cook was a billionaire businessman who set the highest of standards. When Joe Gibbs arrived in 1981, he immediately lived up to them. Over the next six years, the Redskins made the playoffs five times, won three NFC championships, and captured two Super Bowl titles. Unfortunately, Gibbs' run of success spoiled his owner. Cook now expected every season in Washington to be a Super Bowl season. I am in a state of ecstasy. Never mind that nonsense about euphoria and so on. It is sheer, unadulterated, uncompromising ecstasy. But for three straight years, the Redskins fell short of their owner's expectations. By the time training camp opened in 1991, Cook's patience had worn thin. And Mark Rippon's holdout was not helping. Mark's deal was up. He wanted a new deal and set out for a little bit there in camp. And uh, I think, obviously, Mr. Cook being the owner, you know, why isn't he here? You know what I mean? All those kinds of things. Irritated by Rippon's absence, Cook lashed out. The bloody idiot received the message loud and clear. <laughs> Mr. Cook came to practice, and I went over and said hi to him, and he said, Mark? What kind of a year are we going to have? He says, well, we're going to try to take it all the way this year. Well, God bless you then, Mark. Go out and do it. This looks like something I do. He gets the mighty blockhead award here. In the preseason, Mark Rippon was still the same quarterback, surrounded by the same questions. After the Redskins stumbled to a 1-3 and three preseason record, Cook decided he had seen enough. He pointed that little finger at me like he would do, and he goes, you have messed this thing up. He goes like that, and I, I kind of was taken back. I says, uh, in, in what way is that? He goes, I'll tell you one thing. You kept too many guys on this team that are old, okay? And then he goes, now you take Jimmy Johnson down there. He's doing it the right way, okay? And he stuck that finger at me again. You know, well, now I get, you know, I get the veins kind of pop in my neck, and he goes, I just got bought out of this company and I got $18 million and I got to figure out what to do with it on taxes. He says, I'm going to go try and make some money and so you guys can throw it away. <laughs> and then, of course, in his usual way, he went like this. He goes, I'm not going to mess you up. You got to do what you think, but I'm telling you, this is what I think. You know what I mean? He gave me that with the finger. And uh, I said, yes, sir, Mr. Cook, I got it. Every year I start off. And I got an owner that says we're going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> All the fans say we're going to the Super Bowl. And on Sundays when I go in there, it should be the happiest day of, some, of a lot of people's lives. You know, the, the fans are out there throwing Frisbees. They're eating hot dogs and stuff. And I feel like I'm going to throw up. <laughs> By the start of the 1991 season, Jack Kent Cook had openly challenged both his coach and his quarterback. In week one, Joe Gibbs and Mark Rippon responded with a performance guaranteed to please even the most demanding owner. Rippon got a man wide open. On it, touchdown, Washington Redskins. Rippon led Washington to nearly 400 yards of offense in a dominating effort. performance tonight. Oh, I think he's been outstanding. Preparation was very good. They knew what they wanted to do against this defense, and he's been very sharp. Back he goes, avoids the pass rush, going deep on the fly to Clark. Touchdown, walking to the Redskins. A beautifully thrown ball, speak of the devil, Mark Rippon. The 
55-point win was the most one-sided victory in Redskins history, and it made Mark Rippon look like one of the best investments Jack Kent Cook had ever made. Before the start of the 1991 season, Redskins owner Jack Kent Cook had upset his head coach by praising Jimmy Johnson and the youth movement in Dallas. In week two, Joe Gibbs set out to prove to his owner that younger was not always better. For a second straight week, Gibbs successfully orchestrated his offense. But when it came to his defense, Gibbs chose to delegate. Joe was the offensive guru, and he oversaw the offense, and that's where he needed to stay. And Richie Pettibone was a defensive guru and, and handled the defense, and that's where he needed to stay. I always, with Rich and those guys, uh, I'd always walk down there, and the only thing I'd ever say is, please stop them. <laughs> that's the only thing I could help with. Richie Pettibone, being as smart as he was, he had a scheme for everything. And you're just watching these guys come in and out. We had the nickel defense, the dime defense, the penny defense. As they were switching players in and out, I was the one that never left the field. And so I started depending on myself that I needed to be the leader that these guys expect me to be. In the battle of youth versus experience, Charles Mann won the fight and the Redskins won the game. Washington erased an 11-point deficit and captured their second win. But the following week, the nine-year veteran who never missed a play almost missed the game. Hopefully we can come out on the winning end of the stick. That night, uh, you know, I went to the Dulles Airport Marriott where we stayed the night before the games, and... Um, at 12 midnight, my phone rings, and I just naturally reached over and grabbed the phone, and it was Joe Gibbs. And he says, uh, Charles? I said, yeah. He said, I got a call from your wife. And I said, yeah. He said, she's in labor. Boom. I hung up the phone and was gone. And uh, Cameron uh, Wesley Mann was born at 642, seven pounds, two ounces. I hadn't had very much sleep, not other than nodding off and on every now and then. Uh, and I was so excited about the fact that I, we just had a son. Baby Cameron, can you read that? Born today, 646. That's for my family. I gotta get one more sack though. I got two kids. Ready up. After that, I'm through. Man delivered, turning in his finest performance of the season. After three games, Washington was in possession of an unbeaten record while Mann embraced a few memories of his own. I had two sacks, a forced fumble, a recovered fumble, and, uh, you know, we clobbered the team. So, you know, it was all in around a great day, and I raced back to the hospital afterwards. And I mean, it just, you couldn't have wrote a script any better than that. Charles Mann's perfect script was part of a perfect season as the Redskins remained undefeated after four weeks of play. Against Philadelphia, the Redskins' second all-time sack leader added to his tally by overpowering the Eagles in a two-sack performance. The Redskins had many gifted players, but none was as gifted in as many ways as Charles Mann. I always have a saying, his saying was, you can't get in all the lines in heaven. You either get in the front of the smart line, and you get behind in the physical line and all these. Charles somehow got in almost every line, you know, in the front. This guy this is 6'4". He's got a 28-inch waist and can run like mad. I used to kid him. I said, how come I don't look that way in a suit? <laughs> With his lethal combination of size, strength, and speed, Mann led the Redskins in sacks for a third time in 1991. And in week five, he led Washington to its third straight home shutout. 
we still got a lot of good football ahead of us, and you know, uh, we just hope we can stay injury free and keep playing the kind of excited, motivated football that we played today. All NFL coaches work hard, but none worked harder than Joe Gibbs. He labored day and night to ensure that his team would be more prepared than the opposition. His life is football, and that's it. He slept on a cot, you know, for years at Redskin Park. So if Joe was making that kind of a commitment, how in the world could you cut corners? How could you not give your all? His spirit that he brought um, made other guys feel that, gosh, this is a guy that really cares about who we are and what we're doing. And they talked about this being their Super Bowl. Hey, expect that kind of effort. Expect a great effort from them. And every single swinging guy starts with teams. Let's hit it rolling now. Let's earn this thing today. Nothing gets away from us. Let's earn it today, okay? It's our turn right here. Let's get this thing. Our Father, who art in heaven. I'll be done. I mean, you just respect somebody like that. I'll be done on and uh, it's great to be able to respect your employer. Let's hit it now. Let's go. If I get this thing, let's go. Get it over with. Let's earn it. Earn it today. Now let's earn it. When I think back to that team, they, they were highly motivated. And all you had to do is kind of, you know, point them in the right direction. Give them a good game plan. They were ready to go. Preparation was the cornerstone of Gibbs coaching success, but he never set out alone. 13 seconds or so. Gibbs staff was the largest and brightest in the league. He had five former or future NFL coaches working alongside him. We can't say enough about our coaching staff and every single game we went into play, we were prepared, you know. We were prepared mentally to challenge any team we had and, and you really you really have to take your hats off to all those guys and for what they meant for our football team. The meeting of great coaching minds was a nightly ritual at Redskins Park. The entire staff would descend to a room they nicknamed the Submarine to begin devising their weekly game plan. It's kind of like, you know, we're getting ready to submerge and we're going down and uh, we ain't coming back up until the game plan is done for that night. We knew to shut it down for the night when the we had a trash truck that used to come at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I still remember that. Everybody would sit back there and you hear this, and it'd be dumping the trash outside, and I'd go, oh, okay, it's about 3, man. We need to wrap this up. Richie Peck and uh, Emmett and Torgy, all four of those guys working together as a group, I think. Gibbs made good. sure everyone knew coaching the Redskins was a team effort even when it came to their biggest play of the 1991 season. So when I came, Coach Gibbs mentioned that to Rod me. Rod Dowhower happened to be sitting in, uh, you know, in our meetings, obviously be a very important part of it. And he came up with this idea, we need to sprint out, try and get the safeties to slide a little bit and let from the backside over here, let Gary Clark just slide right down the boundary, hopefully get the safety to move and turn and throw all the way back across the field. Sprint bomb. And so, you know, it's one of those things, this is how smart I am. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, geez, I, I don't know about that, Rod. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> In week nine, the Redskins were facing the defending Super Bowl champion New York Giants. Having lost six straight games to their NFC East rival, Gibbs favored a conservative game plan. But after a horrible start by the Redskins' offense, Gibbs knew his game plan had to change. You know, he was always so good at coming in there during halftime and figuring out a way we can adjust and make adjustments to try something and see if we could, you know, get a, you know, get out of our doldrums and, and maybe get something going. There were a couple of things that we kind of started hitting on. One was we call it gut seal. You seal the backside with a trap, and then you block zone up front. And what Ricky was doing a great job of in that game, it kind of got going in the second half because we'd have Donnie Warren come across and cut, and he started hitting gut. 
and we started to get something going running, and then we hit a couple of big plays, and one of them was sprint, bump. Rolling out to the near side is Griffin, who steps up and throws it long for Clark at the five, grabs it, touchdown, Washington Redskins. Oh, what a great pass by Mark Griffin. He just aired it, dead, solid, perfect. Couldn't have been better. If one play epitomized the Redskins' success in 1991, sprint ball was that play. The coaching staff had the brains to conceive it, Joe Gibbs had the guts to call it, and Mark Rippon had the arm to throw it. It was a perfect opportunity to sprint bomb, and, and once I threw it, I said, it's all over with. This is, this is it. Griffin's 54-yard touchdown pass preserved Washington's perfect record. The Redskins had won eight straight games, and Mark Griffin had won over his team. Mark, at that point, uh, for all of us, the team and everybody else, I think we believed. And, you know, he kind of earned his way into our heart, and I think he'd proven that he was a quarterback that could, could take you all the way. Give him a kiss for me, will you? Love you. I always felt like with Mark, people could easily miss what made Mark a heck of a quarterback. Yeah, he'd throw an out many times. The ball might wobble and stuff, may not look that good. He was not a runner, not athletic, didn't run around back there. And so he was kind of clumsy looking at times. But what he never missed was the deep ball. Man, I'm gonna tell you, that deep thing there, he could hit it. I, I think we were, gosh, we must have been 75, 80% on capitalizing on big plays. That says a lot. One receiver's gotta have an ability to get open, you know, get a get separation from a defensive back. Protection has to be good. The throw has to be good. We were uncanny. We had 30 plays over 40 yards that year. It was unbelievable. He had, the, he had the perfect football mind. He was set on that front row of that, that meeting room. If I asked anybody in there a question, he was so in tune with what was going on, he'd answer. Both inside guys backed up. We can still block it, but it's not, it's still got to run a lot. I won't ask Rod. We had all sorts of packages, you know, and that was the uniqueness of what we were doing. We went to three wides, we went to two wides and two tights. We went to two wides, two running backs, and one tight end. We had a lot of different uh, variations in an offense that was very multidimensional. The Redskins' diverse offense benefited from a trio of talented receivers, Art Monk, Ricky Sanders, and Gary Clark. Known as the Posse, the three men formed a devastating receiving core. And he's going to throw another fly pattern. There he is. Touchdown. In week 11, the posse soared past the Atlanta Falcons while their quarterback enjoyed the greatest game of his career. Mark Rippon threw for 442 yards and six touchdowns. He was only one touchdown shy of the NFL's all-time mark, and his coach knew it. He came over to me and said, hey, you want to you want to go for the record? And I says, you know, I'm, I'm really not a record guy. I mean, I'm not 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 into those things. I said, besides, coach, we might play these guys again. Rippon had turned in the league's best passing performance of 1991. But his decision to turn down a shot at history was not surprising. Rippon's humility mirrored the overall character of his team. The Redskins were understated but overwhelming. 
Twelve months after being left for dead in the body bag game, Mark Rippon and the Washington Redskins were alive and well at 11 and all. But we still were under the radar. People aren't really taking notice of us yet. Heck, you know, HBO inside the NFL didn't come until week 12. The thing that everybody's talking about is, can this team go undefeated? You were on that undefeated team. Is this when the pressure really starts to build? As they look at their schedule, they will honestly say there isn't a team on that schedule that they should lose to. Once they got there, I think we started, you know, letting ourselves dream a little bit. How are you thinking about the undefeated season? You know, we look at them one game at a time. Sure, you know, at home, sitting around with your wife, and, you know, you're saying, hey, wouldn't that be great? It would be a nice thing, but if we don't... I went home that night, and I remember uh, talking to my wife, and I said, gosh, you know, we're going to need a lot of tickets. <laughs> Can you guys go undefeated? Uh, <laughs> that's a tough question. That's one of the toughest things to do in sports these days. I know Nick's... Uh, I think every team that gets to that point would kind of have that, you know, across their mind. But uh, as happens in sports, the knuckle sandwich was right around the corner. And Aikman runs a drive at Smith up the middle, 25. Comes right to the 20. A block from Martin to the 10. Smith, touchdown, Cowboys! The thing that I believe Joe thought would happen to us that he thought human nature, people are starting to talk about how great you are. That stuff, I mean, it came tumbling in on us. That was kind of like a wake-up call and said, all right, let's back to what we're doing and get back on track. Because, you know, you can have a great as year as you have and, and do all these wonderful things. But if you don't win now, they're not going to remember you for anything other than you didn't get it done. By the end of the 1991 season, Mark Rippon had found the light at the end of a very long tunnel. A quarterback who had once been considered mediocre, he had suddenly become spectacular. Rippon threw for more than 3,500 yards and led the NFC with 28 touchdowns. The Redskins won the NFC East with a 14-2 record and clinched home field advantage throughout the playoffs. Good afternoon from a windy, rainy Washington, D.C. Where the Redskins, who have viewed from the top all year long, have suddenly realized how far they could possibly fall. Rippon had had a career day in Atlanta's regular season visit to RFK Stadium. But the Falcons were flying high from an upset win the previous week. And their newfound celebrity had attracted an entourage. Hey, say hi to Ted Shaker in the truck. Ted, how you doing, Ted? Happy New Year. All right. They had MC Hammer on their sidelines. They were making a music video. I mean, come on. <laughs> Don't disrespect us like that. Why would you even do that? I mean, y'all, y'all know, you know, that you, you haven't won here. You're trying to get, uh, trying to get under our skin. It doesn't bother us one bit. But rap artists and heavyweight champions were just circus sideshows in comparison to Atlanta's ringmaster, Jerry Glanville. What do you think, Mike? What are they doing? Throwing spirals? Hate when they throw spirals. And I'm thinking to myself, it was so far out of context, like for me. I'm down there paralyzed, you know, I'm ready to throw up. And here's Jerry, Dad. I used to Pete, he was kind of, eh, yeah, he was doing a little <laughs> dance and stuff. Thanks for coming, really. We thought we were going to leave your ass at the airport. You know, I can't remember him going, are you scaredy? Are you scared? I'm not scared. Are you frightened? I'm fighting, I'm not frightened. You're, I'm fighting. Are you afraid? Never been afraid in your life? Never. I love you. Especially since you've been there. <laughs> They just totally disrespected us. And we wanted to beat them so bad. Oh. It 
was really a, it kind of shut your mouth kind of a statement that we made to, uh, to MC Hammer and uh, the Atlanta Falcons. The Redskins forced Atlanta into six turnovers, ending the day for the Falcons and their sideline entertainment. Despite the weather, Mark Rippon moved the offense with ease, and Washington's running game ensured the victory. The rain-soaked RFK fan celebrated with a unique showering of affection. One guy threw <laughs> one of those things, and everybody went, hey, whoa. The yellow seat cushions were flying. I think it was a great memory for us, and uh, it was a great day, and I think the weather kind of fit us. Everything did. It kind of all went our way. The following week, things continued to go the Redskins' way thanks to a late change in the Lions' lineup. I could not believe they had a guy named Conover, a rookie, starting at right tackle. So, I mean, I'm just going nuts. Let's go get it. It's out there. The first play, I'm just going to light into him with all my might, wake this rookie up, let him know he's going to be in an all-day fight and he has no chance of winning. I remember getting into his chest before he could get out of his stance hardly, and I was able to reach up and knock the ball out of the quarterback's hand, fumble, Fred Stokes picks it up. First down for the Redskins on like the eight yard line and we go in to score and you know, the rest was history. Andre Ware is back, goes to the left side, picked off at the 33 yard line. Here comes the return by Darryl Green. He's back to the 10, cuts to the five, touchdown, Washington Redskins. In the NFC Championship game, the Redskins flexed their defensive muscle while they showed off the league's most prolific offense. Washington strolled to the NFC Championship, outscoring their two playoff opponents by a combined total of 48 points. Their domination was more than impressive. It was historic. The 1991 Redskins posted the largest average margin of victory among all Super Bowl champions. With the win, Mark Rippon rewarded his coach's faith by finally becoming a championship quarterback. While Joe Gibbs rewarded his owner's loyalty by delivering Washington's fourth Super Bowl berth in 10 years. Super Bowl 26. The big game became the big chill. Instead of warm Miami or sunny San Diego, the league took its championship to frigid Minneapolis, Minnesota. The only thing colder than the weather in the Twin Cities was the reception Joe Gibbs gave to the media as his team prepared to face the AFC champion, Buffalo Bills. Our week up here, we're going to try and keep as much as we can a regular work week and uh, try and enjoy everything as we go. And um, like I said, we're excited about being here. Joe had an uncanny knack of brainwashing people. He said the same stuff over and over and over again. Outside, he's a good, he's a good receiver. And you're talking about a great quarterback. So on offense... What you got is a problem. They got some tough suckers on that team. You know, they're great. You're talking about the most valuable player in the league at running back. Yada, 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 yada. And then the camera would be in front of us, and we would say they got there's some tough suckers. Those guys are uh, great players, big, strong, and fast. They got a great team. They have some great speed. Like, wait a minute, that's not my words. That's Joe's words. Their athletes and their team defensively are as, as, as good as there is in the league. So 
What just, about the Redskins? Was it a lot of fun to interview the Redskins? This week? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, this is this is like a convention of morticians. I mean, this is this is not a fun group. But I'll tell you, you know, and but compared uh, to, compared to Joe Gibbs, a lot of them do go through life with a lampshade. No, but but one guy yeah. said that we are a perfect reflection well, of our coach. Of We're dull. <laughs> I don't picture myself that way, but then again, I guess you always look at yourself a little better than what other people do. And so I think people look at that and they say, well, this guy, man, he has no sense of humor. Look at him. He's milk toast. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think the difference between teams is a very small difference. Because of under Joe Gibbs' system, there's no real superstar, but it's a super team. You know, we weren't sexy enough for the media. We couldn't sit back. And that us. fact was made abundantly clear when USA Today ran an article criticizing, of all things, Mark Rippon's hairstyle. Oh yeah, my haircut. Uh, he's kind of blasé. You know what? I don't. I didn't. I'm not there for those people. Uh, the people writing it didn't like us for some reason. It was just kind of like, well, gosh, these guys aren't flamboyant. It's, geez, something's wrong with these guys. Thurman Thomas was getting all the press, and Bruce Smith, and, you know, and Cornelius Bennett, and, and, you know, they're the guys. And so they were, you know, so preoccupied with stuff that Thurman Thomas obviously uh, didn't have his helmet when the start of the game happened. Kenneth Davis is in at running back, not Thurman Thomas. Let's see. Kelly goes back, wanted to hand the ball off, was left with nowhere to go. It's pounded at the 45-46 yard line. Kenneth Davis was supposed to run the ball, which makes us ask, what's wrong with Thurman Thomas? You know, I mean, this is the biggest game of your career, and you don't have your helmet when the game starts? Thomas eventually tracked down his helmet. He would need it. The Redskins smothered the Bills' running attack, holding the NFL's most valuable player to 13 yards on 10 carries. Once their ground threat was taken away, the Bills' offense collapsed. Jim Kelly was sacked five times, and the Buffalo players began losing their helmets for a whole new reason. The Redskins' defense had silenced the Bills' explosive attack, but Gibbs and his staff were far from finished. They had all the defense come together and said, we got to play. Kurt Gouvea, I want you to sit on the H-back, and this guy, you do this, and Wilbur, you do that, and Jim Kelly's going to throw the ball right here. Now, Kurt, you should make the play. Kelly the pass, blitzed up the middle, has to dump it off, picked off, intercepted at the 25, to the 20, and the 15. It's Gouvea to the 5, almost to the end zone, forced out of bounds at the 2. Seconds into the third quarter, Jim Kelly and the Bills were ambushed by the brains of the Redskins coaches and the brawn of their players. The interception led to another Redskins touchdown. Washington was comfortably ahead, and Mark Rippon was about to showcase his signature talent on football's biggest stage. Again, going deep. He's got Clark in the end zone. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. With his bad hair and bizarre celebration. Mark Rippon proved that style points were of no value in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I mean, I watch that in slow motion. I go, oh my goodness, what is he doing? But that's just the emotions caught me at that time. You know, this is a Super Bowl and we are handing it to him. And I came over to the sidelines and, and uh, one of the guys from, <laughs> from Disney came over and tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, by the way, uh, you're the MVP. And that's kind of when I started practicing my lines, you know. I'm going to Disney World. I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> Mark Rippon's fairy tale ending was so fitting. A question mark quarterback when his story began 
Rippon silenced his critics as he delivered one truly magical season. This ring right here doesn't mean, gosh, I was great. I had to play great cheer. These are memories. These are guys that, you know, they were a huge part of what we did. Stood behind their, their group and just raised to a, an, an unbelievable level. A level that I think is the greatest team that ever played in the Super Bowl. Rippon's tribute to his teammates was returned by the same man who one year earlier had been his harshest critic. It reminds me of uh, the success that I had in my career. It also reminds me of the quarterback. So I put on a ring and I think of Mark Rippon. While Joe Gibbs had guided his quarterback's path to his place as a champion, Mark Rippon had helped his coach's journey reach legendary status. Gibbs was now the only head coach in NFL history to win three Super Bowl titles with three different quarterbacks. I was standing out on the field waiting to do an interview with uh, Charles Mann, and he, he said something that really struck me. I'll always remember it. He said, gosh, we just won the Super Bowl. But really, it was the getting there that really was what made it so special. It's the struggle of getting there. It's not as much having got it, but it's all that going through it, all the obstacles you've had to overcome to get something that hard. Okay, so now here you are, picture this. You go through this whole year, you win a Super Bowl, you just let out a big sigh of relief. I go out, grab Pat, give her a hug and a kiss, we get in the car. Okay, and just before the limo pulls off, this fan grabs the door and jerks the door open this limo. He knew we were in there, and he goes, hey, we got to get them next year, you hear me? He goes like, I thought to myself, I'm going to give me 30 minutes, will you? I thought to myself, here we go again. I think that's probably part of a football coach's life.